I decided that uh, this is something that I want to learn. Then I started looking for members of this family, people who could, uh, I, I would learn from. And uh, one thing that uh, really struck me in this is, uh, is the whole atmosphere of the raga, the grandeur, the uh, you know the the whole flow. It's like a like a unfolding, gradual unfolding. But right from the beginning, every note steeped in in, in the raga and really identifying the raga from the sound. The sounds, it sound itself seemed to come from some deep place. You know, it's, it was not a not a, a superficial sound. It was a sound that resonated everywhere in the, in the consciousness, in the body. So uh, that is something that fascinated me. And then I started, uh, I got the opportunity to meet one of the daggers, Ustad Zia Mahayuddin Dagar. And I started, gradually uh, started learning. And uh, although at that time I was studying, so I did not really do it full time, but very seriously. Now, uh, uh, if you will hear the next recording, which is again a, a, a part of the same HMV long playing record of the Dagger Brother, Elder Dagger Brothers, the only HMV LP, only LP of theirs that uh, came out in India. The others all came out abroad in the UNESCO collection and so on. So uh, if you hear, if you play the next recording, then you'll see how the it progresses. That was the sthai of this uh, Dhamar in Darwari Khanada from their LP. Uh, uh, the whole sound of that of the percussion and the way it so it, it was like the somebody has described it. It is it is like a regal procession. The whole way it, it unfolds and then becomes much more dynamic later. We'll come to that later. The <laughs> the Pakavaj player in this recording. <coughs> was S.V. Patwardhan of the Nana Panse uh, school of Pakhavaj playing. 
we'll, uh, we have a recording that will come later of this of S. V. Patwardhan playing with the Dagger Brothers in a radio broadcast. Uh, now, uh, one thing that struck me, although uh, the, this recording did not uh, uh, go to that part, was that uh, the manner of playing this percussion with this uh, song, the Dhruva or the Dhamar, was very different from what I was used to in, in other kinds of, in sitar or khayal. Here, the, I, I mean, after a certain time, the improvisation starts, and apparently both the I mean the, the drummer and the and the singer are just doing it simultaneously. The, the singer improvises, the drummer improvises simultaneously. The drummer it does not give just the take up. Maybe he does it sometimes in, in the beginning, although there are many Pakhaj players who don't do that also. Right from the beginning, they are just playing improvised yeah. phrases. So uh, on the Pakhaj. Yeah. So, I, so, shall I continue? Yeah. So, uh, uh, this is something that was very uh, unique. I mean, uh, I could see. I mean, it is actually something uh, that is done also in Carnatic music. In Carnatic music, also there is no theka as such, but there is simply the divisions of the tal, and and the the uh, the drummer and the improviser. So. Uh, this was again something that that struck me as being very distinct. Although this is something that I, although it, uh, I could see that, it's something gradually as I learned, I understood this. Now, uh, the Pakhavaj player, uh, uh, although uh, this recording was just a small piece, uh, I found his playing really extraordinarily brilliant. Uh, although in the beginning, he, he just goes slowly. And then when the improvisation starts, he shows uh, what extraordinary skill he has and how fast and, and how virtuosic his playing is. But in this part in the beginning, he he's very, very restrained and does not do a show any of that. But then uh, as it progresses, he really shows his firepower, you know. We, we'll come to that later in a, another recording. And uh, this Pakhavaj player was not uh, very well known, although he was really, I would say, one of the really best Pakhaj players of the time. I mean, to be playing with Mohinuddin and Aminuddin Dagar, he had to be very good if they selected him for their only LP released in India. Uh, he had to be uh, certainly very good. And he was, he's there in all the radio broadcasts that I, that I have. Now, uh, coming to the recordings, unfortunately, uh, there are, although there are a, a substantial number of recordings, the recording quality is often very, very uh, poor. I mean, these recordings were, uh, I mean, ex uh, this was, of course, a long playing uh, record uh, recorded by HMV. But most recordings that we come across are things that were just recorded, uh, sometimes even with a Nagra, but with, by total amateurs. And often the Tanpura is too loud, there is too much background noise, there is uh, and that is what you will see in the ne next few recordings of an uncle of these two singers that we heard, Moinuddin and Aminuddin Dagar. Uh, his name is Rahimuddin Dagar. And uh, he, was, uh, he was the younger brother of the father of Moinuddin and Aminuddin, Nasiruddin Khan Dagar, or rather Nasiruddin Khan, because the the, this uh, surname or uh, title Dagar was never used by this family uh, before the 1950s. The, because uh, this is something that was added, in fact, by Rahimuddin Dagar himself, and then taken up by other members of the family uh, that uh, they started calling themselves the Dagars. Although, to, um, honestly, before independence, they have not been, uh, they have not, never used that name and I have not found a single instance of the, the, the uh, these of members of this family being called the Dagars. They were always Zakiruddin Khan, Allah Bandi Khan, Nasiruddin Khan, and so on. So uh, uh, often we hear from people that the, this is the Dagar Bani and as such. Now, as far as the Bani is concerned, the, the it is not very clear, you know, it, the, uh, uh, the different Banis of Drupad, you know, 
there are really no very concrete there there is no, nothing really i mean it's all very vague honestly what what characterizes each of these banis there are some vague descriptions in some books often mutually contradictory the the dagars used to say or the the the, the bairam khan descendants of bairam khan and his brother uh, uh, who are the singers we, we have been uh, listening to now and we will uh, continue to listen to the, the what they say is their uh, style their singing actually encompasses all the banis of drupad so in their singing they have the gauhar bani they have the dagar bani they have the dagar bani and they have the nawar bani that's what faimuddin dagar also used to say and uh, in different uh, parts of the performance they use the so the banis are actually not uh, like something of the gharanas of khayal as such the banis are something different they are they are certain styles they are certain ways of treating the raga and any singer uh, is free to use all of them actually although in some but there is a predominance of one uh, or the other so the dagar say that in their singing the predominance is of the dagar bani although they use khandar bani elements they use gauhar bani elements and so on so uh, uh, um, from the 1950s onwards this family started calling themselves the dagars and it became a kind of a a, a very distinct kind of a name which uh, is almost like a brand name and uh, especially uh, from the 1960s onwards when the same singers nasir moinuddin and nasir aminuddin went to europe and uh, they were invited by alan danielu the uh, famed uh, musicologist and uh, who well, i mean i'm sure all of you have heard of him uh and they became quite well known their their whole year tour of europe in the um, early 1960s was a huge success critical success they were they performed in some 30 or uh, uh, you know perform concerts over a period of a month or two months and they had rave reviews everywhere in paris and berlin uh, some of which i've quoted in my book after this the name dagars or the dagar brothers sort of got embedded in the consciousness and then in the 60s of course you had this whole uh, transformation in europe uh, you know the young people coming even taking the ex, you know going to the extent of uh, you know taking a volkswagen beetle or something and driving all the way from uh, iran and afghanistan to <laughs> to india and sometimes you know even going around india on some kind of enfield bike and again going back to europe like that it was i i met the dozens of people who did that so th- that time in the young among the young in europe after the vietnam war and all those uh, that uh, 1960s flowering or uh, opening of the uh, 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 you know whole uh, liberal way of looking at things and so on the uh this uh, drupad and the dagar brothers uh, sort of although not to a great extent but as a part of that it, it fascinated some people and uh, people started coming to india some of them took drupad lessons some of them took many took sitar lessons and so on now uh, that is how uh, gradually drupad started getting a worldwide audience the the first were moinuddin and aminuddin and their extraordinarily successful uh, tour and the unesco recordings of asavari bhairavi and kamboji that were released and uh, now we come to some other members of the family moinuddin and aminuddin were the most recognized singers of that time there were others in the family who were older than them their uncles for example who had a great amount of knowledge and expertise and but i never heard them till i was actually full time into drupad and learning drupad then i heard uh, of course i heard zia muhyiddin dagar ustad zia muhyiddin dagar his brother ustad zia fariduddin dagar who were my first teachers uh, i learned from uh, from uh, ustad zaref dagar for a, for nearly 10 years it was in, during that time that i heard another singer of the previous generation from these dagar's brothers or cousins that we know that was rahimuddin dagar and then 
Unfortunately, there are not many very good recordings of Rahimuddin. There are a few excellent recordings of Moinuddin and Aminuddin, and we'll come to some of them later. Uh, most of them are in uh, our archives in the West. There are some in India, but often they are, they are not accessible, being in private collections. There are, at the NCPA, Mumbai has some good recordings, well-made well Nagra recordings. Now, the next uh, interesting, very uh, record, uh, interesting recording I heard was of Rahimuddin Dagar. And uh, we'll uh, play that now. <laughs> Unmute yourself, please. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, this is the first time I'm doing something like this. So I, uh, I beg your indulgence. So, uh, the thing is, now, this is a recording that I, I would like to play a few times more. Now, as you saw, see, here he's doing Sargam, you know, Padha Magare and all that. First in Sri, and then he switches to Kamboji. Now, uh, superficially, uh, it, it, it sounds like a simple sargam, I mean, but if you hear carefully, you will see that in each of these, the, the notes are not the normal notes that we are used to. Please play it again. And please uh, listen carefully. First, uh, Sargam of Sri, if you hear carefully the Dha and the Ma, and then the next time I'm going to play it again now, after the, I speak now, and now I will request uh, you to just stop it at that point where he switches from one rag to the other. Mm -hmm. you see, know, you, there is a distinct place where he goes to Dha and stands there, then he switches the Dha and then he goes to Kambuji. Now. If you'll hear the first Shri, you just he's hear that Komaldha, hear that Tivra Ma, hear that Pa, you'll notice that the Komaldha is abnormally low. The Ma, the Tivra Ma is a bit high. The Pa is a bit low. 
Yes, the ray is low. Now please play it again and now listen to, uh, to the dha, ma, pa and re in Sri. <laughs> Now you see, he sang Shri, the dha was a very low dha and ma is a bright high, higher ma, tivra ma. Then at a certain point, he went to this dha and started raising it slightly. The low is this dha and then the, he raised it a bit. Then he came to the shuddha dha, which is a low shuddha dha that is used in Kamboji and then he switched to Kamboji. So this is a, 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 a actually a demonstration of his mastery over what are called shrutis. You see, in the, the Dagars, and the Dagars were the last practitioners of, in my opinion, uh, who really, I mean, although there are people who still do these things, although, you see, this way of uh, developing a raga, this way of establishing a raga <coughs> through pure notes, that is, you sing a dha, and the dha is the dha of Shri, and of no other rag, although it is a komal dha, but there is a certain shade which belongs to Shri. There is a certain shade of pa which belongs to Shri. This pa is a low one. Uh, this is something that was very new to me, or this is something that, uh, that fascinated me, and then gradually I understood the reason why this recording of the Dagger Brothers that I heard, that was the first instance of Drupad that I heard in my life, why it had this power. Because, you see, as I said, when I heard that recording uh, in my college days, the very first note, the Tanpura, and the very first Sa, it sort of just brought in this Darbari, the feeling of the, of the Raag. Because they had tuned the Tanpura and they, had, they were singing the Raag and with every note, even the sa, using this peculiar coloring and shading that is unique to Darbari. Similarly, what Rahimuddin is doing here is each shade of the notes is colored by the fact that it belongs to Sri. And uh, that is what it gives this, uh, it, this, uh, this kind of quality, this intense hypnotic quality, the da. Dha, the pa, the ma, everything. And then he, uh, in this uh, second recording we heard, what Rahimuddin does is that he just shifts a note slightly and goes into another raga. That's a way of, I mean, he was, he was an expert in that. The, his brothers, uh, I mean, Nasiruddin was said to be a great master of this. And it, that's a demonstration of that. And... Uh, this is something that fascinated me and I wanted to understand this. I wanted to understand what are the theoretical principles behind this. Because we all hear, we all read in the books, there are 22 Shrutis in Indian music. But no one uh, you know, could say anything about them. And when I heard this and when I started learning Rupat, I wanted to understand the whole principles behind this. And that is a quest that eventually took me to some of the other Dagars. Although Fariduddin from Zia Fariduddin Dagar Sahib also, I got a lot. 
and he used to always show like and and also his elder brother like for example the ma of multani the knee of miyaki malhar or you know the ray of jay jay vanti all he used to sing and show it but he would say nothing about what uh, what is what decides this what are the rules that decide where where the pa, uh, the pancham of shri should be he used to say that the pa itself changes which is again uh, completely contrary to what is the established wisdom in 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 indian music that the pa and sa never change but he used to show that the pa does change he used to show that even the sa uh, has a slight color according to the raga some are brighter and a little bit sharper some are slightly with i wanted to understand what is what underlies this what are the principles what are the what are the concepts and uh, that's some, something that i i never managed to get from him uh, uh because you have to understand one thing also these people used to be also very secretive about these deepest concepts that is something i've written in my book some people will be unhappy to hear this but this is the bitter truth in the somehow uh, uh in the gharana system and perhaps also for other reasons i have un- analyzed this in detail these deepest concepts were somehow kept as esoteric knowledge taught by training and systematic pedagogy to a chosen few usually members of the same family in rare instances someone outside the family because every person who has this knowledge is also deeply concerned about its survival and somehow in the last 500 years or so the best strategy for survival of knowledge became uh, passing it on hereditarily because of, i i i have analyzed this why why is this because i think the conditions became very very difficult when you have a music that is uh, heard by a very small number of people mainly the aristocracy and uh, there is there is very little room for anybody to to get into that circuit and and get patronage and then uh, where the pedagogical system is so complex and takes 20 years to to go through then the best strategy is to simply bring up your child in that in that immersed in that pedagogy and that whole way of life and ensure that he is uh, is the next and then because it it was it became very patriarchal it was inevitably the male uh, successor who got this knowledge although there are uh, instances uh, i mean if you hear read, uh, there were female uh, mostly again for queens and aristocrats and people from uh, women also uh, who sang like for example uh, the queen of gwalior the wife of raja man singh was uh, known to i mean uh, said to be have been a very accomplished singer of, of obviously of drupad because man singh was is said to be one of the originators of drupad uh, along with his court singer nayak bakshu so uh, uh, this became hereditary and uh, uh, one of the reasons in my opinion why the, they they were not these were so open with this deep knowledge of concepts although they were open to showing it demonstrating it and uh, letting the student uh, try to do it by imitation which uh, honestly speaking is, is impossible uh, in a real sense unless one knows how to do it and unless one goes through the methodical training to acquire the skills and the techniques to do it then uh, so uh, this is those a reason for this kind of secrecy or, or reluctance to to openly discuss uh, they would discuss in bits little okay the madhyam here is like this but when i i wanted to know what, what decides that uh, well um, it was just said that this is something you have to learn from the guru well but the uh, uh, i was not sure i mean if that is how it is learned then it will change over the period of time it's not something that will have consistency unless there are some principles guiding this so i then eventually for uh, i have written it all in my book my relation with with these with the daggers my teachers were had a lot of ups and downs it was it was not something very straightforward or complex and i have openly discussed this in the book 
because I do, I see no point in in trying to present a rosy picture of some you know people you know in uh, you know just uh, in, immersed in the Guru Shishya parampara. There are a lot of nuances and complexities in the uh, in that, uh, and the knowledge is something that is really very uh, something that one has to work to get. And if, even the Dagas said that that. Uh, you have to really, uh, you have to really earn this knowledge. This you cannot be given like that. You know, they said that uh, even our children, although the, uh, they cannot be given, and they have to earn this knowledge. So anyway, I uh, then went to some of his uh, cousins of Ustad Fariduddin Dagar, first to Sayyid Saab, Sayyiduddin Dagar Saab, in Pune. I I learned important things from him. He was very open. He was very uh, eager to 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 show things. I think one of the reasons was also their family rival reason. Uh, he uh, uh, he showed me things that I, I that I, I had never known before. Techniques of the voice, uh, absolutely. The first the first time, for example, I came to know that uh, the real technique involves changes of position. You don't sing from one position. The position in the body changes. That is something that was uh, uh, astonishing to me. That's something I got from him. He showed me the techniques of how to do that. Then he said that the, all the, the theories, the principles, is something that um, my elder cousin Rahim Fahimuddin, who lives in Delhi, he knows best. So uh, then eventually I went to him. I was then working for uh, a project of the Maharana of Udaipur Foundation for the digitization and uh, release of some CDs from their archives of, of the elder Dagger brothers who heard in the beginning. And then eventually in that project, some six recordings were released from that collection called the Royal Series of Mewar, uh, which is uh, difficult to get now, but I'm sure you can get, get some from somewhere. Uh, uh, in connection with that, and I went, uh, that, that sort of was a starting point of uh, going to Rahim Fahimuddin Dagan in Delhi. First, looking for some photographs for that project, and then when I sat with him, I saw that he was able to answer all the questions that I, that had been in my mind for years. Now you'll notice that in this recording of Rahimuddin Dagar, uh, the notes you see the dha, the low dha, the high tivrama, the pa <coughs> has some kind of fuzzy coloration. You know, like, uh, please play uh, just a bit of that again. The same track. see the dha you know the way he's pronouncing the syllable dha a soft kind of you know dha you know pa pa you know not uh, not like pa but pa dha you know it is like as if the syllable is ringing in the sound you know that is precisely the description that i heard from fahimuddin dagarsa when i went that the, you know the syllable the pronunciation of, of each syllable is done in such a way that it just sort of floats on the sound. 
the sound itself has a kind of a halo. You know, the dha is surrounded by a halo of resonance, like a, like a light, like a candle. And then the or and the, the syllables are, are are like floating on this on this sound. And the, uh, this uh, so this is something. There is a whole complexity in this of pronunciation, of sound, of resonance. How to control this serves this halo of resonance around the note. How to pronounce in such a way that you retain control of this resonance. You because the pronunciation affects the resonance. So these are very subtle, complex things that I started uh, hearing from Faimuddin Dagar Saab when I went to him. And then I started hearing of certain concepts that uh, in a, a certain kind of a very elaborate terminology to describe all this. Like for example, Udat, Anudat, Swarit, so on. So uh, now we'll play the next recording, which is uh, a continuation of this Lalit, uh, uh, not Lalit, sorry, the, which is a continuation of this recording. I mean, he, uh, this was Sri and uh, he's drifting from raga to raga, but in each he's making those changes specific to the raga, and that's his way of showing his control and mastery. He switches from one rag to other, another, and he makes exactly the minute adjustments in all the microtones to get into that new raga. So now the next uh, recording we will hear has some of these. He's talking about some of these concepts. Mere Although, the, as I said, this, uh, many of these recordings are very poorly recorded. Yeah. Or even they may be recorded on Nagra, but the placement of the mic and all is... I mean, sometimes the Tanpura is so loud. But, uh, and also, uh, you could not really make out what he was saying. But he was basically trying, uh, saying something about the Ma, the, the, the Dham. There are two Ma's here, Tivra and Koma. He was saying about the, uh, the ma on which he comes, da ma ma, that one. Now, he's saying that you can see in his the singing 
that ma is when he, he comes from this again the dha is low the dha and the tivra ma and this ma dha ma ma the second ma it sort of brightens and opens up so he's saying that iski udat avastha hai udat avastha nahi hogi iski to wo raag ke hisab se sahi nahi hoga matlab raag ki wo pehchan nahi banegi the raga cannot be identified or it will not fit the raga if it is not udat so these are the terminologies that i started hearing from fahimuddin dagar when i went to him and started learning gradually and now uh, uh, what he's saying here is that each note has a certain kind of treatment uh, uh, in this recording it is not there later in the same piece he's saying that this ma is udat and it is kamalvat it's opening like a lotus so if you hear this again you will see that in this dhama ma the the last ma has a bright opening feeling so please play it again mere ga so uh you can see the some of the terminology that is using can you hear me yes all right so uh the terminology uh you can see he's saying udat is ki udat avastha then is uh, another point although it's not very distinct what he's saying if you hear uh, on a good in a, a good recording i mean if you hear this uh, directly Uh, uh, uh because of the internet it's not coming very well you can actually make out what he's saying he's saying that uh, the notes are not static the notes ek jagah pe khade nahi the notes are infu- infused with life means the note itself becomes a kind of a organic entity it's always in a flux we don't have standing straight notes in this music the note is uh, sort of changing all the time through some inner processes and this is where the connection with the with the 
yogic systems and Vedic chantings comes. That is, the, the notes are colored in a certain way through some breathing from some inner pranic uh, system of the, which you have to train in. It's a systematic training to, uh, to, to acquire that. And then the notes can be colored like this. So that this Ma of Lalit, as it com uh, comes down to Ma, and then it sort of brightens, and it's Udat, and it's Kamalvat. So uh, this is something that I started learning from Faimud. This is what I wanted. I wanted this uh, to understand the theory behind this all. And uh, what are the principles that decide whether a certain note will be high or low or whatever. Uh, uh, I was not willing to accept, uh, perhaps because of my my scientific background and my background in physics and mathematics, that this is something that is just, you know, something you have to learn from the guru. Sure, you have to learn from the guru, but uh, uh, you have to learn how to do it. You have to learn the concepts, the principles for that decide. Uh, how the Ma of Lalit should be sung. Uh, so, this is something that I started uh, getting from Fahimuddin Dagar, and then gradually over a period of eight years that I learned from him, and he he was uh, uh, in in that death stage in his life. I think he was really uh, because nobody in his family or uh, from his students had come to learn from him really, and. And he was uh, very uh, he was very disappointed by that on the end he was not uh, uh, he felt uh, I mean I've written it all in my book again so uh, he uh, wanted really that somebody should uh, learn this and uh, be a, somebody should at least understand all this and so he was uh, he just poured out things to me and uh, he also allowed me to record. For at least five, six years, I was able to record all his teachings, all his talks, his demonstrations. And uh, uh, I eventually, um, that, that stopped. And I have explained in my book why that happened. But uh, uh, I accumulated a lot uh, from the learning from, from, and then again, going back to the recordings and looking at them. Uh, and gradually I started understanding the whole theoretical conceptual framework behind the whole music. And uh, he actually also wanted me to make a, to write a book about all that. And I started writing even then I, uh, I made uh, several beginnings, but uh, it never took off because I was busy not only learning from him, but also trying to make a living from because I was already uh, doing performances when I when I had gone to him, I had started doing small performances, workshops, etc. And then uh, uh, I, I could not get down to the task of writing, but uh, I recorded things. I made a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, not written notes, but just simply rec uh, recorded things and kept them. And uh, eventually, I was able to do it much later in, in around 2015. Before that, I started a few times, abandoned it. 2015 was when I started writing this, all this down. And that the result of that is this book. In the book, I've tried to explain these subtleties because what the Duggars, uh, what all this is about is a certain tonal system. Ultimately, every music is, de uh, is decided. Every music has a certain system of fundamental system of, of notes. What are the intervals? How far is the fifth? Uh, how far is the third? What is the third? Which third are you going to use? What, what, what are the scales you're going to use? What are the intervals? What are the... All this uh, is at the base, uh, the foundation of any music. And this is what uh, decides uh, the whole feeling of that music, the whole possibilities of that music. Now, uh, the this... This music, eventually I learned. From, uh, in fact, the Dagars uh, or Fahimuddin used to always say one sentence that uh, this is based on murchanas. And uh, murchana is the secret that makes notes belong to ragas, like the, the notes of Lalit. 
the ma of Lalit. Why is it the ma of Lalit? Why is the dha, the dha of Shri and not of any other raga? Although it is dha, the other ragas also use that komal dha, but a slightly different color and shade, slightly different uh, in its whole uh, living quality, the whole process of that note is distinct for each raga, the way of approaching it, the way the note colors itself. Because as, as uh, Rahimuddin Raga says here, the uh, the notes are infu infused with life. The note becomes an organic living entity. It's connected with life. So the note, you never stand on a note. The note is in, in flux. So the whole, um, all the concepts behind this, that is what I started getting and getting from him. And that is what I tried to explain in the book. The, this music, ultimately, if you ask me to, to uh, say it in a brief, is based on a different tonal system. And that tonal system is called the Grama Murshana system. It is a system described in the ancient texts, the Gram and Murshana. That is a, a, a system that, uh, uh, that decides all this. It's a system, a very system, a very simple system of... Uh, generating microtones or generating intervals. Now, of course, we know, I mean, for, that uh, the, the, the notes are, uh, can be, are, are the frequencies are simply ratios of prime numbers, ratios of whole numbers. Uh, so powers of the prime number three, powers of five uh, divided by that. The, that's what the ratios, these ratios are, are the frequencies. Now, in the old system in India, the, because if I if some if I tell some someone, please sing the ratio nineteen divided by seventeen, there is no way that person can do that because that's not the way the mind operates. You would need a calibrating device to produce that frequency, that whole ra that ratio. But in the Indian system, there was a method to do that in practice, which is called the Murshana system, which is simply that you take a set of notes. Then you take each of the notes as the starting point and generate a scale. So if you have Sare Gama Pada Nisa, seven notes, Do Re Mi Fa, so on, then you make the next one, the Re, your, your Sa. Imagine that is the Sa, and then see what are the distances. And again, you make the next one your Sa. Again, see what are the distances. So what this, this is called the system of Murchanas. Each of these new scales produced by simply shifting the position of the sa is a murchana of that set of notes. You can have seven notes, five notes, you can produce murchanas with that. In principle, you can produce murchanas with two notes also. <laughs> now, if you do that, you find that because of a simple fact that the this powers of prime, it will never come back to the same point. You know. So, uh, the primes, I mean, the powers of the primes. So if you take uh, power uh, three by two, and uh, that is the pa, and the again pa and pa, uh, multiply by three by two, it will never uh, return to the same point. So what ha happens is when you uh, do this, when you simply change the position of the sa and see the other distances in a set of notes, in a group of notes, what you're doing is you're seeing all the mutual distances. When you see all these mutual distances, you find that some of the distance are new notes. They don't belong to this set. They don't belong to this original group of notes we started with. This is the Murchana system. So each time you get some new notes and then you repeat and repeat and then so from, from just Sa and Pa, you would get Ma and Dha, and if you continue to do that, you will get 22 notes and even more. This is the Murchana system. It is a very practical, simple way to generate the notes and study them um, with the voice or with, with any instrument. You can simply take a fretted instrument or a stringed instrument, tune them, and then simply change the Sa, decide that this is my new Sa, and then see all the others you find that they shift in a subtle way. This is how the these note, notes are generated. And in fact, 
in the Western music also, of course, they were confronted with this problem in the Renaissance and Baroque music when they realized that if you change, the, if you tune with perfect fifths on a keyboard or whatever, and as soon as you change this, the tonic, take the, uh, the others uh, will go out of tune. So uh, that's a simple fact. So then, because they wanted to create a music where you can freely change the key, and then you can have multiple layers of melodies, they had to, for practical reasons, find a solution to these things getting out of tune. So they decided, they uh, developed the system of temperament, where they took an approximation where things don't go out of tune. So uh, the either the mean temperament or equal temperament, uh, it is something well thought out and done, done uh, to produce a certain kind of music. Now the Indian music did not go into that path, but it uh, the old Indian music, uh, accepted those new notes that are constantly created when you take all mutual distances. That is by the Murshana system, you produce newer and newer notes. The Indian system uh, used them, but then when you start using that, you realize that you cannot use them as static standing notes. The notes must be now colored by a certain living process. There must uh, the whole resonance of the note must be, must change with time in a very controlled, well-defined manner. Only then can they be used in, in music. And not only that, when used in, in, in a music in that way, they have a kind of a special feeling. The note itself acquires a certain characteristic. Uh, the note itself is sounds, you know, many 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 kinds of things you know you can produce the feeling of pathos or you know a, a sort of a brightening up or a, a, a very very abstract kind of very uh, feelings or you know uh, feelings uh, uh, of a very at a very universal level can be produced by the note itself so this system requires this coloring of notes, and this is something that comes from the Vedic chantings. Because if you see the old texts, the Vedic chantings were based also on this tonal system. Although, in my opinion, much of the Vedic chantings we hear today in India is not consciously, it doesn't consciously use that anymore. That knowledge is lost or remains as a vestige of through certain practices, but not really understood. And the same in, in music also. And the Daggers, in my uh, opinion and experience, were among the last people who, who had a working pedagogical system to implement this in music, the Grama Murshana system, which uh, more, many musicologists in the 20th century described, like Bhat, V. N. Bhatkhande, for example. Uh, said that this is a, a gone, a gone and lost. Nobody knows what it is, but it did survive in some traditions. Uh, apart from the daggers, I would also say the some of the Saini traditions of the direct descendants of Tansen also practice this. You can hear it in some of the very, very few recordings that survive, and also in their writings, and also in some traditions from that where this is done in practice and. The musicians, very, very few, mind you, they actually take pains to, uh, mostly it's now in instrumental traditions, very few remaining, who actually take the pains, the some of the senis, or uh, there are no senis left anymore who practice music, I mean direct descendants of Tansen, but some of them, that uh, they take pains to, to, uh, to if they are, if it's Jai Jai Vanti, then the, they will use the correct low shade of Ray, and so on. In, in the Dagars, this was a systematic knowledge of concepts, principles, pedagogy to, to do this. So now we'll go to the next recording, which was a, a very powerful recording that I heard of Rahimuddin. Um, it was really amazing, his mastery. And not only the mastery, but 
the way he sings and uh, in between he he just uh, recites some urdu poetry some lines of galib and then uh, some some other thing and then goes on singing again so uh, please play the next one Get it, 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 get it,
Yeah, so uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have intermittent power here, so we have, I've lost power, so I'm on backup now, but that's fine, it'll work. Uh, so in that recording, it's a composition, a very fast-paced composition. Unfortunately, on this, uh, you can't hear it very clearly. Even the recording is, uh, is honestly not that good, I mean, but we are lucky that even this exists. So uh, because of Rahimuddin, there are very few good recordings. Uh, and mostly are, they are not even accessible. Um, uh, even the few good ones that are there. So uh, in this you can see it's a fast paced composition in Tori. Again, all these subtleties of the notes, all the shades, all the finer aspects of pronunciation and sound and uh, the coloring of sound, the microtones, the everything is so well preserved even in this composition with, with drumming. So basically in Dhrupad, because of this tonal system of Gram and Murchana, because of the subtle shades of notes that have to be used to give the rag its character and feeling so that uh, an isolated and individual note itself carries the entire feeling of the raga. Because of this, you cannot really make this a very fast music. You cannot ma make this music a demonstration of this uh, skills of, of speed. So uh, that is why this music can go up to a certain tempo like for example in this composition and I'll give a few examples in Allah but there is a limit to the speed because at a certain speed you lose control over the resonance, over the pronunciation, over the subtle colorations that are needed to preserve those characteristics of the notes in the Gram Murchana system and make the Raga stand on its uh, on the strength of the notes themselves rather than simply 12 notes uh, and you know high speed passages with 12 notes the subtle shades of notes cannot be preserved at a at more than a certain speed which is why this music is a has a certain limit on how fast you can be now what happened is this old music gradually went out of circulation out of fashion or whatever this uh, old knowledge got lost and a new music emerged again i've written in my book through a variety of influences also i guess 
around the 16th century, this system of Gram and Murchana started going, getting lost. And from the 17th century, uh, yeah, from the yeah, 17th century onwards, you find that the classical texts, which, the, which then switched to Persian, because uh, from the 17th century onwards, from the times of Shah Jahan and other, the, the, the Shastra texts were mainly written in Persia, even by you know, the, some of the descendants of Tansin who wrote works, like, for example, uh, uh, this one of the sons of Kushal Khan, and uh, uh, and even later, the, the the language was Persian. So, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these Persian writings of that time were not really studied. And in this book, I've I, I've especially uh, got uh, Persian text translated. Uh, it was a very very difficult thing to do because, you know, this uh, old Persian. There are very few people who can even read it. Yeah. The, the calligraphy, you know, this cursive writing from those times. And uh, uh, there are a lot of problems in, in Persian. Uh, first of all, in Persian, you know, there are uh, often uh, in Persian writing, uh, the R, E, U signs are omitted, you know. So because the these uh, accents or, or the signs like whether a vowel is a or e or u, this is not indicated. It is understood from the context. So a lot of the terms have become very difficult to read because uh, because the writer is assuming that you know it already. And if they are archaic terms, then you simply have to guess. And uh, so they are very difficult. But I uh, managed to. Some have been translated already by. Uh, scholars in the West, some, uh, uh, not many in India, but, uh, but there are a lot of texts in, in collections in the West and also here in, in some uh, libraries, uh, the Salajan Museum, for example. And the, I, uh, I was able to access some of the texts and get some of the parts which are interesting translated. Now, the Gram Murchana system, you can see that from these Persian writings, it is slowly going out of fashion. And this way of determining intervals using Murchanas and Ragas characterized by Murchanas, which, for example, is the way the Man, Man Kutuhal of, the, of Raja Man Singh describes Ragas, then the earlier texts like Sangeet Ratnakar describes Ragas using murchanas. For each rag, it will state the murchana to which it belongs. Once you state the murchanas, then you clearly say what are the intervals, whether you are going to use a low ray or a higher ray. I mean subtle shade. No, I don't mean komal ray and shuddha ray, but if you are using a komal ray, will it be a lower common ray or the higher common ray? That is decided by the murchana. As soon as you specify the murchana, you specify that. So uh, that system goes out of fashion. And now to deal with this complexity comes a new system where they start saying that each note has seven shades. You, you notice that in the late 16th century, uh, 17th century writings. Like for example, the Shamsalaswat of uh, Rasbaras Khan and, and then after that, Usul al Nagmat Asifi and all. The, the new concept, although they still talk about Gram and Murchana, but uh, in describing Ragas, they are talking because uh, they have now switched to what is called the Thart system. And not so, the, in the Thart system, we are talking about Komal Ray and Shuddha Ray and all, but then they are talking about the shade of uh, seven shades of, for example, of Komal Ray. So, but uh, if you th if one thinks carefully, this system is actually inconsistent with Murchanas. It, it, it is simply uh, logically not consistent with the system of 22 Shrutis, if you give it some thought. So obviously, 
a uh, lot of things went out of fashion uh, or uh, knowledge was lost or out of practice somehow some traditions continued to do this in practice and preserve it as a some kind of a special knowledge uh, within a small group and the dagas uh, their treatment of ragas follows the old system of gram and murchana each of the ragas they treat is used according to its parent murchana like for example if you are doing bhimpalasi then the 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 the, the murchana that is appropriate to that will be chosen then apart from that because the gram murchana system is a is a system of iteration it is something that doesn't stop at one level of 22 but you can it's a system to generate finer and finer intervals so there are even more subtle changes that come in the, the beyond the 22 that those are also used they are also mentioned in ancient texts uh, so uh, the dagas use this system now unfortunately a lot of the recordings as i said are poor quality only a few very few are of a of a very high quality or quite good most of them are uh, from recordings made in the west of the elder dagar brothers uh, uh, most are from uh, various uh, radio archives and so on not easily accessible now uh, uh, the next recording is such a recording it's uh, although i don't know to what extent you'll notice that it's better quality but uh, i hope uh, you can all uh, download these files and then play it at home and then you will really be able to relate to it so uh, please play the next one re ra no dana tene na dana re ra ra na ra na re na re na na re na na re na na re na re na re ra ra na re na na re ra ra na na re na na re ra ra na Tanai tanai 
Yes, so now in this recording, you see that, uh, I mean, although you can't hear it, if you, when you download it, you'll see, here the voice is very clear. It's, it's, a, it's actually an excellent recording, uh, done in, uh, in the West, uh, during, of course, uh, one of the tours of the Tiger Brothers. Uh, there are, unfortunately, <laughs> very, very few such recordings. Maybe you can count on your fingers how many of this quality. So, uh, of these uh, these um, singers I'm talking about, who who died in the 60s and the 70s, the, uh, especially the elder Dagger brothers, uh, Rahim uh, uh and uh, so on. The younger ones, the, there are recordings of theirs uh, in of, of the 90s and even till till recent times. Uh, uh, and of, of the still older ones of the previous generation uh, before Moinuddin and Aminuddin and Fahimuddin Dagar, there, are, there is only Rahimuddin and his younger brother uh, Husseinuddin have been recorded. Husseinuddin's recordings are again very rare, very few. Uh, Fahimuddin Dagar used to say that uh, the, those recordings are of his old age, although he, he did not really live that long. He died in his late 50s, but he, he used to say that um, his voice had become very coarse and in his in those years that a uh, fine voice that he had when he was younger has, has, is not there in recordings so uh, it's, uh, there are just a few recordings of Hussein Uddin Dagar uh, but um, of Rahimuddin there are uh, many some are of reasonably good quality of the, the elder Dagger brothers, there are again several. And uh, now, one thing is that uh, the these the Daggers used to some of them sing they would sing alone. They were soloists primarily. Rahimuddin was primarily a soloist, so was Fahimuddin. Moinuddin and Aminuddin Dagger used to sing together. Then uh, Zahiruddin and Fayazuddin sang together. They formed sort of regular pairs, and then they developed a style of a, because if, if you'll, you'll notice that each of the daggers has a very individualistic style. And then within their individual, individual, some of them form pairs. So two singers singing together with contrasting styles that, that uh, uh, some of the daggers did that. Some sang, sang alone. Uh, sometimes uh, some very interesting results can be seen when some of the daggers who normally did not perform together uh, gave, uh, uh, sang together or then uh, you, you'll see that uh, the, the singing that you are used to from them, uh, it becomes very different when, uh, when they start singing together and uh, or playing together. And somehow uh, uh, these unusual pairings have resulted in some rare recordings, which are very interesting in their own right. So uh, uh, unfortunately, there has been a slight mistake in the files that I, I had sent. So I'm sending one more file again, but that will be after the one that you'll play now. Uh, so uh, I'm just sending one more file now. Uh, it is a duet of Fahimuddin Dagar and Fayyazuddin Dagar. I've just sent it, but the, you don't need to play that now. For now, uh, we'll play the next one, which is uh, actually because seven, then, uh, there is one seven, which is a wrong kind of file. Uh, that is not the one. You have to play now uh, number seven, Zahiruddin and Mohiruddin do it. This is a duet of Veena and vocal.
Uh, did you send the files? Uh, that, that is a file that you will have to play uh, after this. Now, right now, you have to play number eight, Zahiruddin Mohyuddin, do it. Right. Uh, however, we don't have much time here because they might close. Oh, really? Uh, well, I forgot. So, it's okay. But I'll play the number eight, Zahiruddin, do it. There are two tracks playing simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, did you did you all hear two tracks? Yes, for yeah, some there, time. there were two. Yeah. Yeah. So now uh, that was a mistake. If you want, uh, because at least uh, they are very short ones. Uh, you could, uh, if you like, to you can play them, or we can now stop this and uh, go on to questions if you like. No. Personally, I don't know about time limit, but I'd like to hear you some more. Uh, uh, can you play the uh, those two tracks? Uh, the first one, which is the vocal and veena. Mohyuddin duet. Yeah, Mohyuddin Zahiruddin duet. Good. 
So that was uh, um, Fahimuddin Dagar and Fayyazuddin Dagar singing together. And I find this very, because you see, the whole system of the Dagars, uh, or this whole, uh, there is a very elaborate grammar, there is a very elaborate uh, system of tonal relations, so much really. To, uh, the book is all about that. Now, this whole elaborate structure allows great individual freedom. I mean, you can really, within this framework, create your own style. So uh, each dagger is very individualistic because they, are, they were all trained in a system. But uh, within that system, uh, each is so unique. So uh, uh, this is something that happens when you learn the system rather than learn to simply imitate somebody. You see, if you know the system, then within that system, you, like for example, if you know the grammar of a language, and each writer write, writes in his own style. But uh, it's all uh, based on a certain grammar. Then there are different sub-styles and so on. But in the same way, here, the whole grammar, the whole rich framework of concepts creates a kind of a palette with which you can choose your colors and your, your, your tools and whatever. And you can create your own style. But it will always uh, sound like this tradition because of the underlying principles because of the underlying grammar behind it so uh, th that is uh, uh, see uh, in this recording you have two people singing together who rarely if ever perform together the paimuddin and fayazuddin but you can see each is now uh, if you hear the recordings of fayazuddin dagger with uh, with his regular singing partner Zahiruddin and then if you hear this recording you can see how the, uh, uh, he has adapted that singing because he's sitting now with somebody else so the phrases the turns everything they they they, 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 they can adapt if they know the method so that they can go together so that is a very interesting thing in these kind of unusual recordings of different pairings of the daggers there were one or two more recordings, but we can skip them. But in any case, uh, the uh, the next one that I wanted to play is a composition with Pakhavaj. But somehow it seems uh, the sound quality is not too good here. But you can download it and, and hear it later on. This is a recording that uh, 
has again the same Pakhauj player as in the beginning, S.V. Patavardhan. And I just wanted to, uh, um, uh, you can hear it and you can hear how the Pakhauj is used in improvisation with singing. And uh, it's uh, the same uh, Pakhauj player uh, who used to perform with the Dagger brothers in their radio performances. And this is a radio broadcast. Again, these radio broadcasts are also very rare because in those times, the radio broadcast used to be often live and the, the, no recordings were kept. Or even if it was recorded, it was immediately uh, reused for something else. Only special sessions were recorded and archived. So a lot of these radio broadcasts, uh, which were recorded in the 60s from direct from the air, they don't exist anymore uh, in the archives. So this is one such recording. It was recorded by uh, somebody who has really done a great job. Uh, he is the uh, Maharawal Saab of Dungar, Dungarpur, the, the head of the royal family of Dungarpur now. Uh, one of his brothers was the famed uh, you know, member of the cricket, se cricket selection board. Uh, so uh, uh, this recording is from his collection. He used to record all the broadcasts in the 60s, straight from the air. So uh, uh, you can hear that, uh, download in here. We won't play it because of, uh, it's Gaur Saran. And so now we can go on to the questions. I think I have said a fair amount and much of these details are uh, uh, elaborated upon in great length in the book with a lot of references and so on. Yeah. So if you want to ask something. Um, can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Hi, yeah, thanks so much for the very informative talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, the things you talked about uh, of the swar, um, the descriptors were mostly non uh, sound, like the color of a, a swar or the shade and all those things. So uh, could you put them at all uh, in, in terms of uh, characteristics of sound? Like what, what does that, what does the color actually mean uh, for something that you're hearing? Well, you see, that is the thing. Uh, I mean, these uh, uh, in the old music, they had a whole elaborate terminology to describe these things. And you could hear it and it was taught in a certain system. It was replicable through a certain pedagogy. And they had a terminology to describe this. So they had terminology like uh, Kamalvat Swar, then, you know, uh, Udat Swar, Anudat Swar, so on. These are uh, different ways of uh, in which the swar is treated. And uh, there is a whole era, elaborate terminology that the daggers used. Now, uh, uh, of course, we uh, there is the, the, if you were, I mean, that is something that people can, uh, you know, measure and, and that, that is something that will need very elaborate analysis using sophisticated uh, computer, uh, programs and to analyze exactly what's happening in terms of the the spectrum of frequencies. When I say that a certain note is anudat, I can produce that and that produces a certain uh, feeling in the note that also produces a certain way of uh, way the pitch sort of changes in a subtle way. Now, to, to actually measure it using some uh, very uh, well, well set up uh, experimental or, or record and, and then analyze uh, using some programs. That is something that, uh, that can be done. It has not been done yet, but uh, it, it is something that uh, people can do uh, surely. But uh, right now uh, that thing has, I mean, has not been gone into. In any case, all this is, in, in fact, almost dead now. I mean, you, the, even in the Dagger tradition, I mean, there is hardly anything of this left anymore. For, I mean, people in practice, I mean, some people may know some, but uh, as I've written in my book, the whole knowledge of the system has progressively degraded, declined, you know, fragmented, got lost. And uh, uh, this is, tradition is in a bad shape. But using some recordings like some of the examples I, uh, there is a, if when we hear the recordings there is a remarkable consistency in all these things like for example i played several uh, recordings of lalit 
and Shri. If you compare the, the Shri of Rahimuddin, the, or if you compare the Shri of Rahimuddin with uh, the Shri of uh, the, the duet of Fahimuddin and Fayazuddin, you see that the treatment of the notes is exactly the same. It is the same lower dhavat, the same slightly raised tivrama, same knee, mutual distances, the treatment, all uh, is, is same. You, uh, I'm sure it can be even measured and uh, precisely and demonstrated. Uh, that is something, uh, who knows, maybe maybe I'll do it. I don't know. If the, if the Although I'm primarily a performing musician, it is something that is uh, about which I do have a certain curiosity. Although I can hear it and I can produce it and I know that it's correct. But for somebody, uh, uh, the, it may be necessary. I mean, you can also do a scientific analysis and act, but uh, that that's it'll, it'll have to be a very sophisticated analysis because it's not just we are not dealing with static notes, but notes which are slightly always in flux in a very definite, controlled way. The the resonance, the pitch, everything is altering in a precise, controlled manner. In this, so that's something to quantify and measure, and analyze is a is a is a big job, but it can be done. It can be done with somebody who wants to do it and has the tools. The tools are available now. You know scientific tools. So that can be surely done. It's not been done, uh, not yet. Excuse me. May I ask a question, sir? Hey, please, please. Sir. Yeah. sir, if anybody wants to learn Dagarwani, then what to do, sir? Well, you have to go to a teacher. The, that is the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, all, all this, what I've described in my book, all these concepts, all these principles, uh, to, how to do it in practice is, is, is uh, something that only somebody can teach because uh, to implement it in practice in a music, there is a definite pedagogy. Unfortunately, that pedagogical system, as you, I have written in my book, itself has, has degraded for a number of reasons. You see, the, that pedagogical system is difficult to sustain. Even within the Dagger family, it was difficult to sustain. And you can see the result. I mean, you, if you compare the, the, the previous, I mean, this is something that even other observers have written. The generation of the pre-independence uh, from the royal uh, courts, of whom we have only one well-recorded example, Rahimuddin. If you hear Rahimuddin Dagar, you see the control on the resonance, on the pronunciation. It is still a, a, a certain distance away from the best of the next generation, let's say Moinuddin and Aminuddin and others. Even within the next generation, you see some people uh, uh, have better, more knowledge, more trained. But overall, in the next generation also, there is remarkable consistency. Some may be more adept, some may have no more theoretical knowledge, some, but, but overall, even in, in the next, because even the next generation, but this pedagogical system is hard to, to maintain without support, without a whole ecosystem that sustains it. And that is a huge problem. And uh, I have been trying to teach in this system, but uh, I have been very disappointed. Uh, people, uh, first of all, to, to go through 20 years of training to learn all these things. And then uh, the whole question is, uh, how does one make a living from it? When there is there, there is no, uh, uh, I mean, people uh, largely don't understand all these things. Largely, the, the, the sensibilities, hearing sensibilities of people today are, are decided by the film music or by other kinds of music. Somebody who's trained in that aesthetic, for them to notice these subtleties, because this is also for a cultivated audience. Now, without that, without that ecosystem, to sustain a pedagogy like this is a, is a virtually impossible. You will not find, even if somebody wants to teach that, you won't, won't find the students who will do it. It's very difficult in my, and I'm quite pessimistic whether this can be done, but let's see. Uh, so the only way, way to, do, to learn all this is to find a teacher who, who, who knows all this and who is willing to teach. 
yeah. because yeah. just uh, finding a teacher who knows all this is not enough <laughs> till the person wants to teach this. Wants to teach if he wants to. Thank you. Whether he wants to or whether he doesn't want to. Thank you. Thank you. That's also a huge problem because again, from the point of view of the teacher also, yeah. it's a huge investment to, to teach someone for. And then if someone teach, uh, teaches like that and after four or five years, that person uh, doesn't want to do it anymore or can't do it anymore because simply can't earn money mm. or wants to do other things uh, uh, then then it's hugely it's a huge waste of effort so uh, I started teaching people like that uh, I've written it all in my book of them uh, two or three were, were very promising and good you can hear them on YouTube some of my students at the Drupad Kendra here I'm no more in the Drupad Kendra Bhopal now but the, the, that whole thing is uh, subjudice and there is a whole thing going on there. Let's see what happens to this uh, Drupad Kendra uh, where I used to teach, where Fariduddin Dagar Sahib also taught, which is today in the limbo uh, and virtually defunct. But uh, uh, I tried to teach the, this system there. Of three, two or th of maybe 20 or 30 odd people who came, maybe two or three were promising and good. Of those two and two or three, maybe one or two are continuing still, uh, although not earning a living from it really. Uh, some really promising ones are, are trying to do other things, like, you know, the, you're trying to get a break in pop music and what, whatnot. Because you, if you can't earn a living from it, why, why would someone want to do it? So th there are huge problems in that. So uh, one has to find a teacher, and then well, the teacher has to be willing to teach and then uh, even the teacher's uh, efforts should not be wasted. That, that, so it's a big if. Uh, the present conditions are not suited for uh, on both sides, from the side of the teacher and the student to really implement this pedagogy and, and keep the system alive. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question, Ashish. Uh, I was wondering whether recording technology had an impact on the styles of presentation because recording primarily early recordings they had a limitation durational limitation three hour or three minutes later on tapes you had uh, also some durational limitations so performers used to perform for hours let's say five hours six hours and the recording the way we trace these performances did they impact the way later musicians performers performed this is also something I have dealt with, I mean, not directly, but you see, the, we have written accounts of the music from 1919, 1916, even earlier, from the, then from the pre-microphone era, that is before the 19, uh, before 1935, 36, when first microphones came and started being used in concerts. Then uh, the, at the time, the recording, I mean, because you see, a lot of these people were simply I mean, they did release shellac recordings of, you know, three and a half minutes, seven minutes, later on extended 10 minutes. Those performances for those shellac recordings were, uh, I don't think that they performed for those recordings in the way they would perform in concerts. The descriptions of the concerts, uh, from the, those descriptions, you can see that uh, each performance was at least, uh, I mean, there were, I mean, 45 minutes, one hour, even more perhaps. Uh, but at, at least uh, in the uh, in the conference uh, reports, the time allotted, for example, to Nasiruddin Khan in the Allahabad conference for his two performances, one hour each. The, the time allotted uh, to most senior singers in, the, in that conference is something like that, one hour. So, uh, and then uh, you can see that what they performed was one or two ragas, one main raga and one uh, second one. So the main raga would have been 45, 50 minutes if they had stuck to that schedule. But in my uh, thinking, uh, the very informal nature of those uh, things, I don't think people really very rigidly adhered in those uh, 1930s, 20s conferences to this kind of thing. I think it would have gone on for more than an hour. Then similarly, if you hear the Zakiruddin and Alabandi's performance in, I think, 1919, 
again it said that uh, they they sang for uh, more than an hour just one rag rag kedar so uh, uh, i think uh, the performances are, at, at least as far as dhrupad is concerned were of of that time one hour more than one hour is 90 minutes and then from the later uh, longer recordings you do see that and then when uh, they had to perform for let's say of course none of the daggers were recorded on shellac on shellac there are very very few recordings of drupad somehow even the even the few drupad singers who who recorded on shellac did not record drupad they recorded kirtan or thumri or like uh, this famous drupad singer from from bengal radhika prasad goswami there are shellac recordings none of them of drupad so then they performed some songs because the shellac companies uh, uh, used to of course uh, record for for selling them the records and the records used to be very expensive in uh, i think 2 or 3 rupees in those times for one shellac record that's a huge uh, by today's standards and the most rich people could afford it so uh uh there uh, the recordings were made uh, I, I there are almost no trupad recordings in shon shellac very very few there are there is one dhamar of aghor chakravarti again it, i think it's a private recording for uh, record, done for a few people not not really marketed as such but then there are there are some dhamars of from the uh on shellac of uh, other other singer none of the daggers uh, so, uh there is the uh, of lalit mohan uh who was a disciple of uh and i think also a relative of radhika prasad or, or no a disciple or or a disciple's son uh, and then uh, the uh, there were ganendra prasad goswami so there were very few the, the mostly dhamars no ala and uh, the, then uh, mostly even those super singers recorded khayal or thumri or something and then from, we come later then the there are these 10 minute uh, ep recordings that is rahimuddin but the, they sang specifically for that for that record, 10 minutes you can see is quickly going through the alap quickly through the composition finishing in 10 minutes then comes the later period where there are the lps then you see the longer performances and then the the recordings on tape from the 60s 50s onwards where the tape duration can go up to 1 hour or so then you can see the real concert recordings are of, one hour 90 minutes so uh, uh, i think people adapted their singing to different recording formats but overall uh, at least from till the 60s and all i don't think the 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 recording time uh, had an influence on how they actually performed in in concerts concerts that i think the duration would have been uh, one hour or more for for one raga right so um i think we need to come to uh, the close of this session it was such a pleasure ashish uh, those, you with us uh, one thing the, the, the five hour thing you know uh, yeah. i think those are gross gross ex- exaggerations i mean performing a, a raga for five hours i've never I, i mean there are no written records i mean in these big conferences the all india conference the allahabad conference there is one mention of of it's a it's again hearsay it, it is somebody who was there in the audience and he gives an interview at the age of 90 in desh uh, from of nasiruddin khan's performance in allahabad and he does say that he performed one raga for for 3 4 hours but um, but when you see the report of that conference uh, it doesn't seem so i he may have performed maybe for one or half two hours but in the memory of this guy it it sort of got exaggerated so the five hour performances are, are in my opinion a bit of an exaggeration okay uh there are some texts where it's mentioned that uh, the performances or riwad or rehearsals were taking place for four to five hours i have not come across them i, I mean i i have to i have uh, read the official documents of the all india conferences and so on but again uh, what have, what what happened in the private mehfils of the maharajas and all that is something uh, then we have to go by hearsay and there are there are certainly oral accounts of that okay uh, but then we have to really uh, see whether how 
Exactly, because there is unfortunately a tendency to exaggerate. Right. Yeah. So it was wonderful to have you, and um, we we have more questions, I think, but we can uh, write to to you yeah, in emails. No Maybe you can I, respond I if you find time. Sure, 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 certainly, certainly. And do uh, share those all those uh, tracks. You can hear yeah. them in quality at home. Yes, <laughs> and, and the session was recorded as well, which I'll share yeah, publicly. Send me a link too, and I'll uh, also maybe people would be interested who could not come but want to hear it later. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. So it's a continuing conversation. My, we might also arrange another session with you in future. Yeah, I look forward to that. The, the, so much is unsaid. <laughs> yes, so much is unsaid. And because of time constraint and a logistical constraint, we couldn't uh, extend because we mentioned that until 5.15, it is already 6. So uh, there is a bit of logistical restraint here. Constraint. So thanks very much. Thanks very much to you, to not to us, but to you. Okay. <laughs> it's wonderful Thank you. to hear, hear your mellifluous voice and the uh, recordings. Oh, thanks, thanks so much. Well, well uh, look forward. I hope we can keep in touch and do, do uh, get back to me with any questions you feel like asking. And...